You're listening to a Whales or Whales production. You're also listening to Whales. Visit whalesorwhales.com for more projects and shows like this one. Hello, everybody! Welcome to Hearthaholics. This is a Hearthstone strategy podcast that apparently kills my vocal cords. This is part three of our beginner's guide, and today we're going to focus on mindset, ranges, and approaching the game. I am your host, Brian, and joining me today is my friend, Andres. Hey, Andres. Hey, Brian. I I love that intro. I love the enthusiasm. Wow, I think that's been the most enthusiastic hello so far. Yeah. It's probably, it tops my podcast career as enthusiastic <laughs> openings, so hey. For for yeah, anyone a- who's listening to this podcast for the first time ever, if this is the episode you tuned in, <laughs> I, I promise like, wow. we, we don't shout like that at the How beginning of every episode. How much caffeine is he drinking? <laughs> and the answer is none. But uh, if it's early in the morning, I apologize. <laughs> I like it, I like it. But yeah, we've been having a lot of fun going through our beginner's guide. Uh, our first beginner's guide was on the core concepts of Hearthstone. The second one was on different deck archetypes and win conditions. And now we want to focus on ranges, which is really the idea of explaining the, uh, or predicting rather the unpredictable, um, which we'll go into here in a second. Predicting the unpredictable. That sounds, sounds good. Mysterious. Yeah. Maybe we need a new episode name. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hello, everybody! I'm going to start over the intro, never really. Uh, <laughs> another thing uh, that I want to point out, some people may have heard us discussing this last episode, we were considering being kind of like an introduction to ladder play, and we've actually decided to make a ladder episode a completely independent episode at some time in the future, rather than part of the beginner's guide, because you really just want to focus on the core concepts of playing the game, rather than any specific modes or anything like that. And we realized there was a very large portion of the game that we thought would be useful to introduce as part of the beginner's guide which is this idea of ranges that's right if you want more information on ladder play and all that we will be doing that in the future but we decided not to make that the focus of this episode um so before we jump into the main topic here andres anything you wanted to cover at the top of the show um not much just been watching the world championship super excited about that uh still rooting for my three favorites hot form ties and ping ping ho the uh-huh. shaman um they're playing right now so we'll see how it pans out they're playing for the top eight as we Ooh. speak nice yeah we are uh for people coming to this in the future we're in october of 2015 so like the second a- uh annual hearthstone world championship is about to begin at blizzcon so people who follow tournaments are very excited and i'm like i need to follow tournaments more because i don't know who these people are <laughs> <laughs> you should it's uh awesome gameplay they they've yeah. been putting out quite a performance that's awesome. Yeah, I, I like that someone's bringing Shaman to the mix. That's, that's yeah, good to two, see again. two people are bringing Shaman, actually, from the Asian region. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah I guess their meta there is a little different. That's cool. Is it, like, similar to our Shaman here in, uh, in the old states? Yeah, well, they play kind of like a mid-rangey version. It's almost like that Totem Shaman that I was playing at the start of TGT. Ah, yes. But it resembles more of the traditional mid-range shaman but they add like the thunder bluff valiants mm-hmm. and i think the, the totem golems that sort of thing somewhere right now billy is shaking his head in disapproval yes and <laughs> i'm just like yes somebody's proving people wrong because i don't uh, know finally. i think people undersell shaman a lot i yeah. think sure enough is not at the power level of what patron was or secret Paladin was yeah um but I don't know. I don't think people give enough credit. I don't think it's in that bad of a spot, especially if you know how to pilot the class, as these well, guys have shown us. If they're willing to bring it to the most important tournament of their lives, like, I, I don't know. I, it can't be that bad. I wonder if, uh, the, the one thing I have to say before we jump into the main topic here is I wonder if um, that idea of Shaman being brought in such force is the idea of patron being nerfed before the tournament kind of showing its colors in the different types the variety of decks that we're able to see now Mm -hmm. so that's kind of cool like i i do appreciate that they nerfed patron right before the tournament so we can see this like variety of new ideas coming. surprisingly though there are two players who still brought patron warrior to the the tournament 
I'm it's, excited to see how that does. It's very, you know? very cool. Everyone just discredited Patreon and thought that he was gone. But the I truth did. is that Patreon is still like a great board control deck that can uh that can have a like a super good draw engine behind it oh. and can still draw into a lot of combos. And then sure, you can't do 45 damage in one turn with the Frothing Berserkers anymore or abuse your patrons with the charge. But you can still use things like Grom to close out the mm-hmm. game, so like a solid 10 to 12 damage. Um, yeah. And then you can also take over the board with patrons, which against decks like Druid or Face Hunter is still really good, especially if you back it up with an armor smith right behind it. Well, I don't know if you've uh, noticed, Andres, but the Hearthstone, we at the Hearthstone community have a tendency to overreact. And if anything changes, to immediately assume the worst. So I guess it's understandable <laughs> that we didn't actually yeah. predict Patron I think, to still honestly, exist. Honestly, that taking away the charge from Patron just took away a little bit of the unfairness that it has. Yeah. Now it cannot win against every matchup. Yep. Before it could run away with any game just because of the charge uh, thing. Yeah. But nowadays it is just a really good counter against aggressive and mid range decks yeah. that rely on the board, kind of like Shaman. Uh, Face Hunter, Midrange Druid, uh, even Midrange Hunter. Although yeah. it, that matchup is a little more even. But yeah. um, even then, you know, it, it'll struggle against Handlock quite a bit now. Like, it's almost unwinnable, mm-hmm. that matchup. But it is more of the rock, paper, scissor that Hearthstone is intended to be, right? Yeah, I think overall it's a good change. So I, I'm also really happy to see it's not gone because yeah. Patron has become just the deck and the, the sound effect and everything about that card and the yeah, deck yeah. has become synonymous with Hearthstone. So it's it still it would quite good against things like here. Secret Paladin too, which is very relevant. So I don't know. There I don't think go. we're going to see Patron go away. We're, we're going to see it more of a, Evolve. as a, a specific choice now to defeat certain decks. That's cool. That, that, I think that's a good way for things to go. Mm-hmm. Speaking of a good way for things to go, let's uh, jump into our main topic here for the uh, podcast. We're going to start with a very simple question, which is what are ranges. And the best way to describe that is to start with an interesting fact about Hearthstone. And that is that Hearthstone's information um, goes into two primary categories. When you're playing a game of Hearthstone, the information you have is either going to be known information, and that's anything that's visible and entirely predictable. Your What hero you're playing, what hero your opponent is playing, uh, what cards are in your deck, not what order those cards are in, but just the 30 cards that you put in your deck. I hope you know what those are. If you don't, you might need to know your deck a little better. Um, you, uh, your current hand, again, not the order you draw your hand, but what hand you have currently is known and predictable information. Uh, the current board state, what the life totals are. You get the idea. It's anything that is fixed and uh, current and visible information to you. That's That's one part of the information you can get in Hearthstone, and that's probably the majority of the information. Very useful stuff to know. However, there's a second type of information that's extremely important, and that is unknown information. And that's anything that's either invisible and or unpredictable that you can't be sure about. Uh, this would be your opponent's deck. While you can't see what class they are, starting out in the game, you do not know what the 30 cards in their deck is. Um, your opponent's hand, uh, what they have in their hand is hidden to you unless you're cheating. Um, the next card you're going to draw, again, the order of your deck is not known to you. So whatever's coming next out of your deck, you don't know what it is. Uh, any RNG effects... Uh, Mad Bomber, you don't know where his bombs are going to go, so that's an unknown effect. Uh, and secrets, what a given secret is, is another thing that is unknown and hidden information. So, what the idea of range is, is it's concerning the second category of unknown information, and what it's doing is it's saying, okay, I may not know what that information is, unless I cheat, I can't give myself a 100% picture of what that is, but what I can do is use a series of statistics and algorithms and understandings about the game to create best guesses about what that information is. So while I may not know what my next draw is, I can know what is the likelihood that I'll go uh, draw a given card. I may not know what a secret is, but I'll know, you know, it's more likely to be this secret than this secret. I may not know what my opponent's hand is, but I know that it's more likely to be this card and this card and these are the cards I should be worried about. So it's this idea of instead of just assuming this unknown information is entirely unknowable and you just have to be agnostic about it and not care, it gives you a starting point to be able to say, okay, here are some best guesses I can make and I can play around this because this is more likely than this scenario. Um, so anything you want to add to that, Andres? That's right. Uh, this is a very important concept and the best players understand this very, very well and have developed skills to be able to create very specific ranges so they can calculate their choices very well. And yep. the reason why this is important is because Hearthstone is a game of information. Plainly, 
information. It's not a game of, you know, fast reflexes or muscle memory or physical resistance like maybe <laughs> other other games or sports might be. Hearthstone is all about a game of information. And if you knew all of the information, like all of the cards in your hand, the order in which your opponent is going to draw the cards in his deck, you knew the order in which you're going to draw the cards in your deck and the cards in your hand, you would play mm -hmm. this game very, very differently. And you would have all the answers needed to play your cards accordingly. But the right. fun part of this game is that a lot of that information is concealed from you. And it's up to you to create a mental roadmap, a virtual map in your head to be able to navigate through the game and be able to deploy these cards accordingly. Why ranges are so important is because once you're able to master this in Hearthstone, this concept in Hearthstone of narrowing down the possibilities that of the cards that your opponent might play against you, that's when you can really start making educated guesses and it becomes clearer what to play every turn. Exactly. Just a basic example for that, if you're playing um, Paladin and you're playing against a Warrior, and you say, hey, based on different information, which we're going to go over in this episode, I'm pretty sure that Warrior has a uh, Fiery War Axe, which is, you know, a 3-2 weapon that can remove my minions. So instead of playing Knife Juggler on turn 2, which will just get immediately removed by that axe, I'll play Shielded Minibot, which can survive two hits by that axe and basically frustrates the Warrior's ability to control your board. It may not be the stronger play just based on your hand. If you're looking at your hand, you're like, I'll play Knife Juggler, and then next turn I can play Muster for Battle, and he'll start throwing knives everywhere, and it's just better. But if you then start thinking about that unknown information as a partial known that you can make best guesses about, that immediately changes what your turn two is go play is going to be and then makes it better against what your opponent has. So exactly. that's just one example. You couldn't have said it better. Um, another good example of that is during your mulligan stage, for example. Yep. Um, if you can have a very educated guess of what your opponent's class is and what he's going to be playing against you, you can choose to keep the cards that are very relevant to that game and drop the cards that are not in favor of cards that might be more relevant. A good example of this is, let's say you're playing Mage against a Druid. You know that mm -hmm. the Druid's best start would be like a Darnassus Aspirant or a Shade of Naxxramas. Knowing this, you know that you might want to keep things like Frostbolt or even better, Flame Cannon which can mm -hmm. deal with both of those. Um, while comparatively, if you're playing against a warrior, you know that he might not be playing things that early game, and you might, wanna, might want things that pressure the board a little more, like your Mana Worm and Mirror Entities that get in the way of his axe. So this is the kind of decision-making that you can make once you start thinking about the idea of ranges and narrowing down the, all the possibilities that the conceal information might be. Exactly. It's it's really fun. I think it's one thing that makes Hearthstone so fun because something like chess, you eventually just memorize the best. Uh, it's it becomes once you're very high level in chess, a game of memorization of what is the best play against a given play, and the predictive opponent becomes what is my opponent going to do next. But Hearthstone not only has that predictive opponent of your uh, ability of your opponent, but it's also you just have to be constantly surprised and guessing about well, what could come next? What uh. What could be the next card he plays? What could be the next card he draws? So instead of working with sure information, you're working with constant surprises and constantly making guesses and statistics. So it brings in some poker elements of that, which yeah. makes it just a and lot more fun, unpredictable, and, uh, and uh, what would you say, like fluid to work yeah, with. Yeah, and arguably it increases the challenge because mm -hmm. your strategy needs to be very dynamic and it changes constantly based on the new information that you receive every turn or the information that you're able to deduce based right. on educated guesses. Uh, a fun fact here is that some of the best players in chess have been people that have memorized a lot of plays and it becomes yep. a game of memorization Towards like the best players are the players who have been able to memorize and practice plays over and over again. Mm -hmm. And funnily enough, the best players in chess have sometimes argued with the idea of adding an element of randomization to the game. Mm -hmm. Just because after a while it gets a little bit stale, you know. Yeah. You're not doing things because you're strategizing, you're doing things out of memory. So they yeah. thought toyed with the idea of maybe randomizing the order in which the pieces start instead of always being the same order. You change it up uh, mm -hmm. randomly, that sort of thing, which which is interesting because that means that in Hearthstone, 
there's never a game that you can memorize. There's a lot of situations yeah. that you can practice and be familiar with, but every game is going to be unique in its own way. It's very rare that yeah. you're going to have a game that's going to play out exactly the same way two times. Exactly. And that's what makes Hearthstone so fun. And really what Hearthstone builds itself on both the casual and competitive players is that it's unpredictable. It's a different game every time. Um, and range is so important because if Hearthstone's biggest selling point is, hey, we're a strategy game with random elements, what range is saying is instead of uh, saying, great, there are random elements that's just out of my control, range is an idea of no, there are strategic ways you can harness those random elements. And actually, instead of them removing all of your power, it helps you be empowered and use those to your own advantage. Exactly. Just saying, oh, it's random, oh well. As weird as it sounds, is a game of of mastering randomness. Yeah. I mean, you're still going to lose to randomness. It's it's not yeah. 100% thing, yeah, but that's the thing. Yeah, sometimes you can't avoid it. And it's it's a good thing to keep in mind when going into a game like Hearthstone. And mm -hmm. it's that no matter how good you are at predicting the game, sometimes the odds will be against you. And no matter how good you are and how many times you've played this game, you will lose. And this happens yep. to the best players out there all the time. Yep. It's a game about aggregate uh, percentages. It is not a game about, you know, win or lose. Yeah, you yeah. Aren't it's a game aren't. where skill shows up over time rather than per yep. game. Yep. So now that we've covered what range is and why ranges are so important, you may be wondering, how can I actually learn and start using ranges? Because I still have no idea what this actually means. So we're going to today we're going to go over each of the categories we listed of unknown information. Um your opponent's deck, your opponent's hand, your next draw, RNG effects, and secrets, and discuss some of the ways that range can be applied to each of these, ways that you can predict them, ways that you can analyze them, and ways that we go about taking these unknown um, categories of information and making them at least somewhat known to ourselves. But before we start on that, there are three points I wanted to go over. The first is that while range is based on statistics and it's very mathematicable, uh, mathematicable, good word, <laughs> mathematicable and calculatable. <laughs> I'm just going to make up words. Um, <laughs> even though it's a very mathematic concept and probably, um, abstractly, it should be possible to like make a perfect range or have the perfect amount of information. It's so complex and it's so, um, wide ranging that it's unlikely you'll be able to do that in the amount of time you have in a Hearthstone term. Um, so a lot of range comes down to intuition. It comes to pulling together this information and making best guesses based on your, your gut feeling and your intuitive feeling on the fly, because you're not going to be able to crunch every possible number and every possible card on every possible turn. So it's the idea of creating heuristics and algorithms to make this stuff just as quick as possible and as accurate as possible in a short amount of time by practice and, um, and by understanding it over time. Yeah, exactly. One thing to note about this is that it's, it's really a skill acquired by experience and mm -hmm. the more you do it the more intuitive it becomes basically to get better at this game surprise surprise you just have to play <laughs> this game a lot <laughs> exactly um you played a lot but played a lot with this sort of stuff in mind um and that'll go that'll go a long way which leads me to my second point which is there is a lot of information that goes into calculating ranges there are 698 cards in hearthstone or something there about there are nine classes there are dozens of deck archetypes um, there are all the card combinations and synergies, and then there's everything that affects each game, like cards drawn, the current board state, cards played, what your opponent's play style is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if you're like, okay, before I start using Rangers, I better go out and memorize all of that stuff now, and then start applying it, you're probably just going to get overwhelmed and give up. Um, some people coming to this might already know most of the deck archetypes and most of the cards. Some people might be coming in just knowing a few cards and decks. Um, in either case, I would say... Just focus on learning as you're playing the game. Like we said, uh, it takes practice playing the game, but you can play 100 games and not earn, uh, learn anything, or you can play 10 games and learn a ton. So just every game you're playing, every card that's played, the order which they're played, how they're played, uh, what deck your opponent is playing, just constantly keep an eye on that and constantly keep trying to learn what you can from it and apply these principles that we're about to go over to it. And over time, you're just going to naturally become better. So you don't have to worry about knowing everything at once. Just worry about when you're playing the game, absorbing that knowledge rather than just kind of passively watching the games progress and hoping you you get lucky and win. That's right. You got to take the game really in like bite-sized chunks. 
And it's not worth it to you for you to go out there and really like memorize every card, every deck archetype, what every deck out there is trying to do and their strategy, because it really is just overwhelming if you're trying to do it yeah. that way. It's just not fun, you know. You're you didn't get into this game so you could go back and study four hours just to play, right? <laughs> yeah, it's really a matter of start learning what is relevant for you. So what I mean mm -hmm. by this is if you maybe are drawn towards Hunter and you started with a Hunter deck and around your rank, you're seeing maybe um, a lot of Druids or maybe a lot of other Hunters, right? So mm -hmm. take some time and start learning your Hunter deck as well as maybe yeah. get familiar with that Druid deck that you're seeing so much. Or maybe it's Paladin that you're seeing so much. Or maybe it's a darn Mech Mage like down at rank 18 is like a bunch of mech mages everywhere and you're tired of losing to mech mage so maybe get a little more acquainted with the deck go over to tempo storms meta snapshot and look it up go over the list that sort of thing yep. but do it in bite-sized chunks only what is relevant to you exactly exactly focus on what you're interested in and you're naturally going to become interested in other things based on it and if you're not then you know maybe don't play the game but if naturally if you're a fan of the game what you're interested in will lead you to learn more about the game so yeah. just focus on what you're finding fun. it's really a game that builds over time so yeah uh, like we said just you don't have to learn everything take it one step at a time no need to mm -hmm. rush instead just view anytime you're playing it as an opportunity to learn and over time you're naturally going to learn it all so um the third point is an interesting one that uh, I thought was worth bringing up because as we cover some of the concepts, a lot of the stuff that you could be calculating in your head, there are currently tools out there that calculate it for you. Um, Hearthstone Deck Tracker is a big one of these. And these are um, UI tools that you can use that not only like archive and keep different decks for you, but also will create a UI on the actual game client for you that'll tell you things such as the per percentage likelihood you're going to draw a certain card, um, what, uh, what order your opponent has drawn cards, what, uh, cards your opponent has mulliganed. It can list your entire deck list for you. It can list what cards your opponent has played so far, etc. Um, there is some controversy about this. Some people think it's cheating. Um, some people think that, um, it w does not hone skills that you're eventually going to want. For example, if you're not making these calculations yourself when you go into a tournament and aren't allowed to use a deck tracker or play on your iPad and aren't allowed to use a deck tracker, you won't have been exercising and learning these skills, so you won't really know how to do it without the deck tracker. Um, I think both of those are valid um, criticisms of it. I can see people saying it reduces part of the fun and skill of the game. I think people go too far if they say it reduces all of the skill. But also, I think they go too far if they say it reduces none of the skill. I mean, it's right in there between. It's going to depend on your personal preference. I personally use Deck Tracker because I like to have more than nine deck slots, and I also find the UI helpful. But I was curious, Andres, what are your thoughts on the, the deck tracking? Uh, any, uh, any opinions there? I think these tools are really good for starting to learn the game and getting information in. One thing mm -hmm. that is important to note is that our memories sometimes are not as good as we think they are. <laughs> and sometimes our memories are biased by certain experiences. Yes. These tools are great at helping you keep track of what is actually happening so that after a while you can go back and look at statistically what you actually maybe faced. Um, mm -hmm. You can keep a better track of what cards you have played because sometimes during a game you might not be right. paying attention. Like most of us are playing this game from home in maybe in our bedrooms or in our living rooms right. and stuff is happening, you know, like your cat starts chasing something or <laughs> maybe your girlfriend needs you over. Or uh, maybe your cat is chasing your girlfriend. Like there are all sorts of <laughs> things exactly. that could be madness, Just madness all around. And <laughs> you just can't keep track of everything. So these tools allow you to maybe not have to think about the game so hard and just mm -hmm. facilitate um, some of this knowledge. Also, I think that, you know, unless you're guy, the guy from Limitless and you can remember everything from the moment you were in the womb, um, <laughs> you're just not going to be able to keep track of everything at first. And yeah. as a beginner, when you're trying to learn all the cards and get a grasp of the game, these tools can help you accelerate that process. I yeah. do agree that eventually, if you want to be more serious about the game, you should um, start honing these skills yourself. Yeah, Although, wean yourself off of it. 
Although, mm-hmm. even in the top tournaments, players are allowed to carry a piece of paper and a pen, and they're about yeah. to they're they're allowed to jot down notes and keep track of things because even the best players, when they're completely focused, they know that they can forget things. And we're trying when you're trying to make quick decisions and calculations on the fly, sometimes mm-hmm. you just don't have time to stop and think, did he play the coin? Or did yeah. he play that second emissary? Oh my gosh, that's like my most helpful thing it has is telling me when they have the coin still. I love that. Um, but I think that's a really good point. I think the best analogy I would use and the recommendation I would give to most people is this concept is training wheels. Um, if you want to learn, and I'm still using these training wheels, so I'm not saying that in a derogatory way that like uh, good players or high-level players can't still use these tools. But it's the idea of, it gets you going. It helps you start learning these concepts. But if you really want to master it and be able to do it without assistance and you know, compete in tournaments, you will at some point want to start training yourself to be able to work without these things. But these things aren't inherently like r- ruining your skills or anything. It's not. No, I think they actually yeah. help help you shape them if you're using them yep. in the right way. So, yeah, I, I highly recommend it. Also, the statistic tracking and all of that is, like you said, amazing. You can see replays of your games and actually look at why you lost. So there are lots of good reasons for these that make yeah, you better Yeah, and it's also it, so. very easily to get biased with this sort of thing, right? You might mm-hmm. only see, like, two hunters in your run, oh, but yeah. maybe you lost horribly to these two hunters, or you're like, oh, all I see is this stupid face hunter. I'm losing a ton <laughs> against it. Well, in reality, maybe you're not losing that much to face hunter. Maybe you're losing exactly. more to paladin, but you're taking your deck against face hunter based on a decision, you know, based on an emotion rather than facts. Exactly. All right, so we're going to jump in here now to how you can actually apply and use range to your game. And like we said, we're going to be going over the uh, the primary unknown uh, factors of information in Hearthstone, which is your opponent's deck, your opponent's hand, your next draw, RNG effects, and secrets. And the first one is your opponent's deck. Uh, they're actually, um, because of how stable and predictable the meta in Hearthstone is, Um, this is probably one of the easier factors you can get regarding, um, being able to, um, hone in on a range or something. And it's also probably the most important one you're going to find because once you can figure out what deck archetype your opponent is playing, you went from his cards being able to be like one of 400 or whatever, however many cards you can get from a class plus all the neutrals to being, um, like 30 or 35. Like there are some texts and differences between a given archetype, but not really that many um, in most like yeah. mid to high level ladder play. That's right. One of the things that can help you narrow down the range of cards that your, your opponent might be playing, and one of the things that the pros use the most, and um, one of the quickest ways is just mm-hmm. knowing what archetype your opponent is playing. Like you said, yep. Brian, the meta in, Star- in Hearthstone is pretty established, and there's about, you know, 10 to 15 decks that mm-hmm. are the most to use. Um, aside from that, you see some variances of this type of deck. But honestly, once you learn the the core of that archetype, most of the cards that you're going to see are, you know, about 24, you know, 23 to 24 cards the same. And maybe like five or six cards that might change from one deck to the other that exactly. one person is playing. So you can you can narrow down your choices quite a bit just by knowing what archetype your opponent is playing. Exactly. Uh, something to keep in mind as we go over these basics. Um, like you referenced earlier, Andros, the best way for you to get uh, get going with understanding what the deck archetypes are, if you aren't already naturally familiar with it, is a meta snapshot. I like Tempo Storm's meta snapshot, but Liquid Hearth also has a really good one. We'll link it in the show notes. Um, but it gives you a really clean, simple, I believe weekly, maybe bi-weekly, um, look at all of the decks out there and uh, ranks them on like what the best are, the second best, et cetera, et cetera. And what you can do is as you're gleaning information about a deck, um, you can just be cross-referencing that information with um, the meta snapshot and be like, okay, it's not that one, it is that one. And, and pretty quickly, you'll be able to hone in on which one it is. Um, so it's really just an idea of seeing that list seeing all the attributes you've been able to notice about a deck so far, and then cross-referencing the two, um, the which we're going to cover the different things you can analyze in a moment here. The last note I have before that is, if you run into a deck and it just doesn't fit into the meta lists at all, like you check a few meta lists and they're just, that deck isn't there, it's a it's a mech um, shaman, or no, mech shaman's out there, let's say a mech priest. You're running into a mech priest, and you just can't find mech priest anywhere. Sorry, I didn't mean to me- knock a mech shaman. That apparently is the whole thing. <laughs> it's a mech priest, and you don't get a why it's running shadow bomber or whatever. Um, there are a few reasons this can be. 
Um, don't let it confuse you too much. First of all, it may just be someone made up their own deck and are playing it, especially in lower ranks. This is really common. People don't have that many cards. They don't really keep track of the meta and they just play whatever. And that's fine. You probably don't need to memorize that because you're probably not going to be running into it again. You're probably not going to be running into it at, you know, any ranks above like 18 or 17. You so. might get unlucky and run against the same opponent and well, yeah. darn it. Well, at least you know what he runs already. So yeah, you're not a to big worry. <laughs> not a big, <laughs> you're right. Not a big worry. And you're probably going to win anyway. Speaking of that's my second point. Often these decks, if they're not in the meta are really bad. Um, so you probably don't need to worry about that. Even if there is like some deck out there, like, I don't know, maybe at some point Pirate Rogue is being played but isn't in meta reports. It's probably not seen often enough and probably isn't effective enough if it's not being picked up by people en masse to really be worth worrying about. However, there is the third category, which is decks that are up and coming and just haven't been recognized yet. Like Oil Rogue had a little bit where people didn't know what it was. Um, I'm sure Patron Warrior had that moment too where people were just like, what is this? And haven't adapted to it yet. Yeah. Uh, not a huge worry since it'll probably be in meta reports within a week or two if it ends up taking off. But I mean, identifying those early on is kind of a cool skill you can learn. So if you start seeing a deck that's doing really well and see two or three opponents play it, start paying attention to that because that may be the next like big thing. Um, so yeah, those are also, just a few points. the last thing yep. I wanted to add to that was that the meta snapshot and that sort of thing are just tools to help you accelerate your learning of this. Mm -hmm. Honestly, this will come naturally just by playing the game. The more you play it, the more patterns you're going to start to pick up. And you're going to oh, notice yeah. like, oh, every time I face a druid, they kill me with a stupid combo. And <laughs> you're going to be prepared for that. But basically, the idea of this is that you just want to get as acquainted as possible with as many different types of decks as possible. Because what yep. this will allow you to do is, from the get-go, know what their game plan is going to be, know which cards they're going to use, know maybe which turns are the most vital for that deck. So it helps you narrow a lot of the unknown information, and it helps you make the choice of, okay, I know this deck is going to go for this sort of strategy and this sort of a place, so I can plan accordingly towards those right. plays rather than just play blindly. Again, back to the concept of ranges and our decision making. <laughs> exactly. Yep. So the meta report is a good tool for that, but eventually it does become second nature. Like I haven't had to check a meta report to know like what a deck archetype is, except for like very new deck archetypes in a long time. That's true for a lot of players. At some point, you're just going to know what the warlock archetypes are. Um, mm -hmm. Speaking of which, we'll go over the fundamentals you can analyze as soon as my dogs start stop barking at the lawn men. One second. Please stand by. We will resume shortly. All right, where was I? Oh, yes. So we can go ahead and move on now to the actual um, things you'll be analyzing to be able to figure out your opponent's uh, what deck they're playing. The first one is really obvious, but it's also like incredibly important. So I figured I'd put it in here, which is the known information of what class they are. Um, you know what class they are, and that narrows it down a lot. Yeah, quite so a bit. If they're playing Warlock, you know it's Handlock or Zulock. If they're playing Mage, it's Tempo Mage, Mech Mage, or Freeze Mage. Um, yeah, it's really obvious, but that's going to be your first clue. Yeah, and it's once you've been like playing the game for, for long enough, you know that there are certain archetypes that you keep seeing with certain classes, right? Yeah. So, for example, you know Oil Rogue tends to be most of the rogues out there. Or you know mm -hmm. that if it's a warrior, it might be a control warrior or a patron warrior because patron warrior still lives. Yep. Uh, if it's a priest, you know, <laughs> so it could like be... like Elvis. Patron warrior lives. Yeah. It's not dead. <laughs> Long live the king. Yep, that's right. <laughs> but yeah, if it's a priest, it's a control priest or a dragon priest. So that sort yeah. of thing, right? You might run into the one-off where it's like a shadow priest and get <laughs> like you completely by yeah. surprise. And that's cool. You know, it's cool that the element of surprise in Hearthstone is actually an edge that you can mm -hmm. have uh, or that your opponent can have against you. Um, one reason I think opponent's class is worth mentioning is if you play other TCGs like Magic, this is a tell that you aren't going to get. Um, you can start like seeing what lands they're playing, but that takes time. And additionally, they can be playing like a three color deck. Uh, in Hearthstone, you get this immediate bit of information that most games don't give you of like being able to narrow down extensively what deck your opponent is playing. So that's, that's something right. cool about being able to see the class, but be aware they can also see your class. So, um, Keep that in mind. But yeah, it starts from here. This is where you start to narrow it down. You first look at mm -hmm. their class. First step. Exactly. Next up, you look at what they mulligan. Um, the mulligan is something that's visible in Hearthstone, so you're able to see how many cards they put back. Uh, it may not seem like a huge um, bit of information about what deck they're playing, because you can't actually see what the cards are. It's not like they when they put them back, they discard and you get to see what they are. It's all secret. However, 
certain decks mulligan more often than other decks. Um, and this is yeah. this is kind of an advanced tactic, but it mm-hmm. it does work. And like we said, we want to use every single bit of information that we right. can get. So even things like the mulligan can give you clues. Uh, like you said, some decks mulligan a little more aggressively than other mm-hmm. decks. Uh, for yeah. example, aggressive decks usually have a, a, a dense low curve of mm-hmm. really low cost and minions. So it's more likely for them to draw those minions early on in their starting hand to the point where they don't have to mulligan as many cards, mm-hmm. where other control decks are usually looking for very specific cards against different matchups. So they're going to be mulligan a little more aggressively. Not yeah. to say that this is true for every deck, no. but it's something that you, you can use as a piece of information. Yeah, um, one thing so valuable at the mulligan is that it happens so early. You don't have to make any play before you get this piece of information which is why it's such a good piece of information. You can even wait, as we've ha- uh, discussed controversially on this show before, uh, because I don't like it and Andres is fine with it. You can even wait for your opponent to mulligan before you make your own mulligan and see what they put back and then make your decision. Um, so you can even go that far in it. So Yeah, absolutely. Another thing that is important in the mulligan stage, and this is not while trying to decide so much what your opponent's class is, Mm -hmm. But if you can have a general picture of what class archetypes your opponent might be playing, if your opponent, let's say, keeps two or three cards and he's a warrior, you know that all of the archetypes in warrior, generally speaking, like keeping things like a fiery war axe or a slam or an acolyte of pain. So just by keeping in mind, if your opponent kept cards in his initial mulligan stage, you can maybe narrow down what he has in his hand a little bit better. Yep. So like we said, if it's a warrior, he probably kept fireworks. If it's a druid, he probably kept things like wild growth or yeah. Darnassus aspirant. But exactly. And that's what knowing the deck archetype can help so much with as we're going to go over um, later because otherwise, you know, classes can have pretty different opening hands. But if yeah. you know and if what you're class not, is playing, If you're not sh- completely sure of what the deck archetypes, there's still like a lot of shared cards between Mm -hmm. the same classes archetypes. So at least you can keep narrowing down the the choices, right? So just like we said, just keep it keep guessing and keep getting clues and your your opponent's mulligan can give you a lot of clues. Exactly. Um speaking of the cards, that is probably I would say it's like the meat of being able to tell what archetype your opponent is playing is what cards they play. Um the mulligan, like we said, any any um any deck can get an amazing hand where they don't have to mulligan anything or a terrible hand. So you're never going to know 100% what they're playing by the mulligan. But once they start playing cards, you can be pretty darn positive what they're playing. Um, for example, you're playing, it's turn one, you're facing a paladin. You're like, okay, is this a secret paladin? Is this a mid-range paladin? Is this some new paladin that exists in the future that I don't know? Um, and the opponent plays a zombie chow. And you're like, okay, they uh, played a zombie chow. So that means that they are not a secret paladin, pretty much, because secret paladins, for the most part, do not play that, and mid-range paladins do. So by turn one, you know basically the, your opponent's entire deck. Uh, you know, it could be control paladin a little more. It could switch a few of the decks around, uh, or the cards in the deck around, but you have a very good idea of it. Um, that's that's the basis of um, opponent's cards. Just, again, if you want to use meta reports, just keep a list of all the cards they've played and cross-reference them to the meta report. And if it just fits into one specific archetype, then you know what it is. Um, yep. One thing to note in the in this particular section is that when you're trying to guess your opponent's deck, but what cards he's playing, mm-hmm. like I mentioned before, a lot of deck archetypes share a lot of common cards. Right. But this is where it comes very handy to be familiar with, you know, the whole deck list of a, of an archetype, yep. because there's usually very specific cards that only that deck archetype uses. A good example of this is Face Hunter versus Mid Range Hunter. Mm-hmm. Mid Range Hunter runs Web Spinners, but Web Spinners is something that you would never see in a Face Hunter Too because slow. it doesn't yeah. play towards that strategy. So if your opponent plays a Web Spinner in turn one, it's a huge tell that he's a Mid Range Hunter. So you can you can start playing your game assuming that he's a Mid Range Hunter. Obviously, this might change later on in the game. He might surprise you, but to be honest. The, the most likely thing to happen is that he is a mid-range hunter. Likewise, if the hunter plays a leopard gnome on turn one, you know that it's either a face hunter or at least a hybrid hunter. And Mm -hmm. depending on how the game pans out, you know, you can 
keep deducing and deducing. Some exactly. decks, on the other hand, are really good at keeping their archetype concealed. Yep. For example, Patron Warrior uh, can hide himself as a control warrior for a long time because they share a lot of the same cards like Fire War Axe or Death Spite, Acolyte of Pain. And it's not till later on in the game that you might be able to tell what deck archetype they're playing. Um, yeah, exactly. And that's why something that's very important to do is even if you have an initial read, like you know, you think you know what class the opponent is playing, keep watching every card after that. In the in the Paladin example, they play Zombie Chow in turn one. Keep watching all of the other cards they play and make sure that continues to support your theory. Like they might start playing secrets and you're like, oh wait, this is just a secret Paladin that for some reason runs this card I wasn't expecting. Or they might start becoming a Paladin you've never even seen before. So it's even if you think you know what arc archetype it is and you're like, yep, that card's only in that deck, keep watching all of the subsequent cards because they may actually prove your initial theory wrong. Exactly. And one of the things to keep in mind is before you have been able to pinpoint exactly what archetype it is, you mm -hmm. want to keep in mind plays that both archetypes might screw you over with, right? Yes. Uh, it, That's a it, really it good point. It becomes a harder game since you're trying to play around more stuff. Although, you know, generally you can neglect certain lines of play because you know they're not going to be too detrimental for you. Yeah. But, for example, if you're playing against a warrior and you still can't know if it's patron warrior or control warrior and it's turn five or six is coming up and you know that he might do like a patron sweep or something like that, you might want to set up your board or you, or you might be expecting still Tarasen to come out and surprise you and be like, oh no, this is patron warrior. Mm -hmm. um, you might want to play around that Thoros and still and not discount completely the fact that it could be Patron Warrior. Yeah, that's a really good point. Play it safe and kind of uh, defend yourself from each archetype until you're sure. Mm -hmm. um, finally, one thing that can help when someone is disguising themselves with their cards is your opponent's play style, and that's how your opponent is playing these cards. Um, let's go back to the Face Hunter example, because that's a nice, simple one. Let's say you're facing a hunter, and he plays mad, coins out Mad Scientist on turn one. It's like, well, that could be anything. That could be Face Hunter. Um, I don't know what that is. And you play Knife Juggler. Um, and then, instead of trading with your Knife Juggler, he goes face with his uh, Mad Scientist. In most cases, a pretty bad trade if you're playing a mid-range deck. That might tell you, because he's being so aggressive, with a card that is in both archetypes, that he's face hunter because he's being aggressive. Um, he's playing in a way that's like face hunter, even with cards that are in both decks. So that's something else to keep an eye on. That's a very simple example. Um, but just yeah. keep an eye on how your opponent is playing their cards. And that Absolutely. Can, can give Play you a style lot of, of your opponent and the way he is playing out his turns can really tell you a lot of what deck archetype would be. Going back to the patron warrior discussion, mm -hmm. a good, a good tale of this is early on in the game. Let's say turn two comes around and you didn't play a minion and you pass the turn and his yeah. turn two comes around and he doesn't play a fiery war axe because he didn't play a minion, but Strangely enough, he doesn't armor up either way. <laughs> and this is a huge tale because a control yep. warrior would never do that play unless he just by mistake just passed a turn and forgot to do it. Mm. Um, but a patron warrior, on the other hand, has a very specific reason not to armor up. And it's because he wants to get at least one point of damage on the hero so that later on he can use his battle rage a little more effectively. Yep. So things like this can really, really tell you what kind of archetype you're playing against that's a great point similarly warlock if they tap uh early on that is huge set their hand lock and not zulock because zulock wants to get tempo and play creatures and handlock wants to well get a large hand um and the second thing is like again if they're just not playing anything you uh you can be pretty sure it's a control archetype rather than a uh mid-range archetype or, or a tempo archetype yeah, absolutely. this can turn against you like some tempo mages just have terrible openings but you know it, it gives you again a range a percentage wise like this is suddenly yeah, more likely just to be trying, this archetype trying to establish the, the the likeliness of you know what your opponent might be mm -hmm. um, um, another for example yep. another good example of this is with traps um yeah. hunter traps Playstyle can tell you a lot about hunter traps for example if your opponent coins out a trap on turn one and follows mm -hmm. it up with a knife juggler on turn two. Um, Snake trap. <laughs> and, maybe, and maybe you have like a mad scientist already on the board. So technically yeah. playing the juggler would be a bad play. Or you have like a shielded mini bot on the, on the board. Um, mm -hmm. So you know it would be a bad play because you're, the juggler would just die immediately to, to your creature on the board. But uh -huh. because he played that trap initially, yeah, you might know, like, no, this is probably a snake trap. He wants me to fall in the trap of attacking his juggler. He's luring me. So I'm not mm -hmm. going to fall in that trap. Maybe try to 
Frostbolt is in the juggler or yeah find another just yeah, go find, face a, find another round <laughs> another example of this is you have your shielded minimon on the board and mm -hmm. he plays a trap and he maybe has a web spinner and yeah. instead of going instead of using his web spinner to get rid of your mini boss divine shield he just goes face yeah. um when he does this you can probably assume that the trap is a freezing trap because it was something like an explosive trap he would have preferred to trade in with your divine shield so that when you run your mini bot into his face your mini bot dies right so just by actually... an by analyzing like the decision making of your opponent you can get a lot of information yeah that's actually another interesting point about uh elucidating deck archetypes is one way you can actually get a better idea of what archetype a, an opponent is playing is if he plays a secret and it's like a hunter revealing that secret makes that become a card that you can then predict what his archetype is. If you just leave the secret up, then you don't know what archetype he is. But if you trigger it and find out it's freezing trap or explosive trap, that'll start telling you what archetype he's playing. So triggering secrets is actually another way to get more information yeah. on your opponents. And uh, again, coming yeah. back to concept being acquainted, you know that mm -hmm. mid-range hunter likes running snake trap and freezing right. trap, and face hunter likes running explosive. So getting more clues. Yep. And that's the last important point about the meta report in general. It not only helps you analyze what archetype it is once you have information, it also just gives you information from the get-go. For example, if currently in the meta, 90% of paladins are secret paladin, that automatically gives you a range of what your opponent is playing before you see their mulligan, before you see their um, cards, anything. Just the pure fact of the meta already gives you a range to work from, mm -hmm. um, which is another interesting thing just to keep in mind. Yeah, absolutely. Just you might be, yeah, you might be conscious that you're running into a meta where everyone who's playing Druid is playing a ag an aggro version of the Druid and you mm -hmm. have not seen like the ramp version where it just puts a bunch of taunts up uh, yep. in a long time. So when you face a Druid, the likeliness that it's an accurate druid it's pretty high. <laughs> so you, you can kind of assume that it's an accurate druid from the get-go start playing as if yep. it's an accurate druid. Again, being acquainted with the metagame, with different decks, can make this become very intuitive with, to the point where you're not trying to think so hard about this. Yep, exactly. All right, so we're going to move on to the second category of unknown information. This is the last big one. Um, but it is a huge one, probably the thing that you're going to spend most of your time trying to figure out. Cause like we said, within a few turns, you can figure out what, um, what deck archetype your opponent is playing most of the time. Once you have that information, however, comes the, uh, the next step, which is what is in your opponent's hand. Um, yet again, the first way to do this is your opponent's class. Um, very easy, narrows down the pool. Not much to say about that. It's known information. Um, the second one, however, is what we just talked about. Your opponent's deck. Once you figure out what your opponent's deck is, you have a much, much, much better idea of what his hand is because you went from hundreds of possible cards to like 30 or 35 when you uh, count in what kind of tech cards you could bring, uh, bring in. So already now that's, that's really the starting point you want to start working with, uh, understanding your opponent's hand is, um, your opponent's class and your opponent's what deck archetype they're playing. Um, after that, you can also use your opponent's mulligan. We actually went over this a little bit when we were talking about analyzing the deck archetype, but depending on if they mulligan a lot, then they probably don't have a good early game. So let's say you're facing a warrior, as we said before, and they mulligan a bunch of cards. That means they're probably less likely to have Fiery War Axe um, because they would probably want to get that card, especially if they mulligan their whole hand. They're probably searching for it. It's still fairly likely they're going to draw Fiery War Axe from that search, but if they had kept their whole hand, you could almost guarantee that they have Fire War X, because almost every warrior wants that in the beginning of their hand at the beginning of the game. Yeah, so, actually, like I think somebody did the percentages, and if you go mm -hmm. first, you have a 45% chance, if you mulligan aggressively for a card, to get it. Mm -hmm. And yep. if you go second, you have like a 52% chance of getting yeah, it. Yeah, it's really good, because so you have four yeah, cards the and then are four good. more. And then draw another one. Yeah, so it's pretty good. But it gives you an idea. For example, if you're facing a super aggressive deck, you're going up against Hunter. It's been mostly face Hunters recently. You're assuming that. And they don't mulligan anything. You need to mulligan for as defensive a hand as you can. You need to get early drops. You need to get things that can stop them in their tracks. Because otherwise, you just realize they have the god hand for their win condition. And that win condition is bursting out of the gate super fast. So keeping an eye on how your opponent is mulliganing can give you a big idea of what they have in their hand, especially if you know what early cards most decks have, because that's typically the cards they're going to be looking for in their initial mulligan. Um, so that's one way to start narrowing down what they have in their hand. Another really obvious one, but very important one, is the cards they play. 
um, as your opponent starts to play cards, that can tell you what cards they have left. Um, the most simple way of this is like, if they play Consecration, and they have two Consecrations in their deck, that means they can only have one Consecration left in their hand. If they... Oh my gosh. One sec. Seriously, we are so sorry. Sorry about that. I had to put my dog in timeout. Okay. No worries. <laughs> I'll start over on that thought. <clears throat> so, an obvious example of this is like, if they play Consecration... Um, and you know they have two consecrations in that particular deck archetype, then that means, okay, they only have one consecration left that they could have in their deck of their hand. So that lowers the possibility that consecration is in their hand, especially since people would rarely, like, keep two consecrations in an uh, opening hand. Uh, similarly, if they play both of them, then you can be sure you just don't have to worry about that card being in their hand for the whole rest of the game. So keeping an idea on what cards your opponent played and when they played them can, can give you a huge... Uh, hell on what they could potentially have in their hand. Um, additionally, like you said, Andres, if they play one card, they may be telling they have another card. Uh, if they play Muster for Battle in turn three and have a coin, you can be thinking, wait a minute, they might have Quartermaster in their hand because they want to play that out on the next turn. Um, so oftentimes, you can think of the possible synergies and based on how they're, which cards they're playing, you can guess which cards they're hoping to follow that card up with. That's right. Uh, anything else to add to that, Andres? No, I think you covered it pretty well. Alrighty. So another thing you can do is, uh, analyze yet again your opponent's play style. Um, this can be a big one. An obvious, uh, example of this is AOE. This is like the one that people probably one of the most important things you can start learning to predict. Uh, and one of the ways to predict when people are playing AOE is how they're playing it. If they've been holding on to a card for a long time and just not playing it and you haven't given them a chance to play an AOE spell, that may be it. Um, uh, have they been letting you gain a board presence without really focusing on removing your cards? Um, that might be another tell that, wait a minute, why are they letting me continue to play these cheap minions rather than trying to, you know, remove them one by one? That might tell you that they're waiting to get maximum value out of an AOE card. Um, other things they might be doing is, do they have their uh, closing combo and are they starting, for, for example, are they starting to like go face when it doesn't quite make sense for them when they're a mid-range deck? That may mean that they are, Closing in and being able to use their combo, the most famous example, Druid's um, Force of Nature Savage Roar combo that can deal uh, 14 damage, they may just be trying to get you below the threshold to activate that. So the way your opponent's playing, um, even within a given deck archetype, can start to tell what sorts of things they have in their hand. Um, this is also something that takes a lot of knowledge and intuition to understand. It's not a clear-cut statistic type thing especially since different people will play differently and sometimes people just misplay. But it sometimes can tell you that certain things are coming, uh, even once you understand what the archetype is. Uh, That's let's right. see here. Uh, and another cool one, this one I really like personally, and it's from a slightly different bit. Um, this isn't necessarily trying to predict your opponent's entire hand, but it's trying to predict, it's trying to narrow which ones you need to worry about predicting. Um, and that's the idea of using available mana. Um, for example, you may start the game and your opponent has Tyrion Forgering in their opening hand, uh, which has, which is an eight cost card. You probably don't need to worry about that card starting out because they're not going to be able to play it for many, many turns. Um, what you're going to need to be worrying more about is what are they going to play on turn one? What are they going to play on turn two? What are they going to play on turn three? What are the possibilities they could have in their hand for those turns? So knowing how much mana your opponent is going to have on their next turn helps you really narrow down which cards you have to be worried about. Um, on turn three, there are only so many cards that um, a mid-range paladin can play. You're mostly worried about, like, um, maybe a... Uh, what's the follow the rules card? Um, the... Um, Peacekeeper? Yeah, something? the Elder yes. Peacekeeper. Elder Peacekeeper, there you go. You may be worrying about them, you may be worrying about Muster for Battle, and you can narrow it down. Once you know the deck archetype and you know how much mana, the amount of cards that cost that much mana or less in that given deck archetype becomes very, very small. So yeah. being able to predict... Yeah, go ahead, Andres. I was just going to say that this is this is a very, very important concept, and w with this, we're starting to gain, get more into the actual gameplay of the, mm -hmm. of the actual game. Um, yeah. All the concepts be that we've touched a little before are kind of like preemptive concepts, right? Kind of like mm -hmm. from the beginning of the game, you can start doing this and you want to be able to narrow down like your opponent's class as fast as possible. But right. once you're able to do that, then the game becomes about, okay, I know my opponent's class. I know what cards are likely to be in his deck. But now I want to know what cards are going to come out and in what order 
they're gonna come out what is my opponent going to do and then mm -hmm. checking for the available mana like you said really helps you narrow down the possibilities of uh, what cards might happen uh, mm -hmm. for example if it's turn three and you're playing against a paladin you know that he might play mysterious challenger or dr boom or Tyrion forging but all those possibilities are almost irrelevant at that point yeah. in the game. You you don't care about them because they're not coming out till way later. Not completely irrelevant. You know, you still want to keep in mind that they have him in your deck. So you that, for example, wanna, if you draw yeah. your big game hunter, you don't want to use keeping it. removal. Absolutely, that can tell you when to keep removal, but not in terms of board development. Typically, exactly, not in terms of board board development. What you should be more concerned about is, like you said, if it's turn three, then a muster for battle might come out. So maybe I want to mm -hmm. do a play that either anticipates that or I want to make sure that I save a play that can counter that. On um, mm -hmm. turn four, his true silver champion is going to come out. So maybe I don't want to play things like an Azure Drake that I spend a whole five mana and then he can easily remove out of one swipe with uh, his true silver champion, right? Right. Um, we know that on turn six... The best play that he can have is a Mysterious Challenger on a full board. So maybe by turn 6, we want to make sure that we have the ability to clear his board and be prepared yeah. for that Mysterious Challenger to come out. This exactly. is the sort of thing that knowing and keeping in mind how much mana your opponent has available can really help us narrow down on very to very specific one or two cards that it, yeah. your opponent is more than likely to play. Also... There are there are like alternative lines of play, right? Like a mm -hmm. a paladin doesn't have to necessarily play a true silver champion in turn four every time. Yeah, it's in fact likely that he might not even have the true silver champion in his hand. Mm -hmm. But at least we know the that the true silver champion is the best possible play that he could have in that right. turn, and we play around the true silver champion so that if anything else comes out, might not really affect us that much. Um, some turns become a little trickier because maybe there are two or more things that might screw us over. So we have to be <laughs> a little more careful uh, and plan the turn accordingly. And sometimes we get put into really, really uncomfortable situations, especially for opponents that are playing well, where you just cannot play around things. And the best thing you can do is play into your opponent and hope that you can maybe seize the momentum or turn the game around later on right and that's a that's a really crucial point which is that idea of weighting the uh, averages there may be you know yeah, a technical 30 percent chance that your opponent has consecration or has true silver champion but you want to play around those worst case scenarios um if they're likely to to just utterly destroy you um a really crucial example of this is um win conditions and that's something that you can use available mana to start to predict around, because if you know what your opponent's win condition is, for example, again, for some nature savage roar for nine mana for druid, you know that like you cannot risk falling below 14 health without any taunt up because they could just ruin you with that. So that's one other thing that I would take uh, really into consideration when um, analyzing what your opponent's cards are, which is keep an eye, keep a constant tab on what is their win condition? How do they win? What cards do they need for it? Uh, how likely is it for them to have these cards and have they been holding on to them? Because something about win condition cards, especially in combo decks, is the statistic probability of your opponent having them is actually pretty high because they often mulligan for them. They often keep them once they have them. Um, and so even if, you know, they've only drawn 10 cards, it's likely that those 10 cards are part of that combo condition because they're looking so specifically for them. Absolutely. Uh, the and the, the, the more the game drags on, uh, the more likely this becomes to... Exactly. You can so, you can have an educated guess on if your opponent has the win condition or not. Um, let's say, for example, against a druid, he mm -hmm. is at nine at, at eight mana, for example, yes. and he has three cards in his hands, mm -hmm. and maybe he only plays a Darnassus Aspirant, or he plays like a Shredder, and then passes the turn. Well, right. he could have played like Shredder and Druid of Claw, or he could have played like <laughs> right. an Ancient of Lore. And he keeps two cards in his hand. This can tell you a lot. This can tell you, well, maybe those cards are reactive spells, but mm -hmm. maybe by process of elimination during the game, you know that he's used two Wraths and one Swipe. And maybe he had an opportunity to have a really good Swipe on your board earlier on, but he didn't do it. So yep. 
you know that it is maybe not those removal spells, which leads to the only other possibility that he might have a savage roar and force of nature, and he might be setting up for his turn nine kill. And that's a really important thing about um, win conditions, or one of the very important things is even though, even though it may be 50 50, they have swipe or they have the win condition, you want to be weighting the chance of the win condition higher than its statistic probability. Because if they do have it at all into the game, you need to put more emphasis on playing around to that than you would other cards, even if it's not more statistically likely that they'll have those cards. Um, which is where it gets really interesting because you, you're not just playing the numbers of what cards are likely to have. You're playing the numbers of what cards are more important for me to play around if they have them. AOE spells and win conditions are the two big things for that. So like, if you can afford it without destroying your own tempo or ruining your own win condition, uh, always consider playing around those, even if it slows you down a little bit. Um, just because of how much they can ruin your entire game if you get it wrong. Yeah, exactly. I see a lot. It especially happens to beginners where they're mm-hmm. they're maybe at like yeah fourteen health and their opponent yep. has no board and they have the chance of playing let's say a heal bot or they have a chance of playing like a, a doctor boom right. Yeah. And for like a new player, the doctor boom seems like the obvious choice. But what happens is that they play the doctor boom thinking mm-hmm. is the best play. But they pass a turn only to receive a combo of trees to their face. Exactly. And lose the game. So Dr. Boom was not the optimal play there. Um, yeah. Healbot would have been the opt- optimal play into maybe Dr. Boom next turn. Exactly. Because you can be like, eh, there's only a 30% chance of them having the combo. But it's a 100% chance you lose if they do. So like, you have to weight the probabilities of them having cards with the probabilities of how much it's going to make you lose the game. So... Yeah. yeah, so very important to be able to predict and narrow down the cards. Uh, I think mm-hmm. uh, these are the most important points, the ones that we went through. You know, yeah. your opponent's class, your opponent's deck, what he's playing, the way they mulligan, uh, the cards that they are playing during the game, um, uh-huh. your opponent's play style, the yep. available mana they have every turn, because that will tell you what they can actually play. Mm -hmm. And keeping in mind, what are the win conditions of the deck? You know, we we want to play around their win conditions. We want to make it very hard for them to meet the requirements for that win condition. Exactly. And there are definitely more ways you could do this. We could do a whole episode easily just on predicting your opponent's hand. Um, It's probably the most commonly used and most complex part of ranges in Hearthstone. And it's something that I'm still like, I could be way, way better at than I am. But it's just something that with these principles, you could definitely start working on. Um, and it will lead you, I, I guarantee it's going to lead you a long way to becoming way, way better Hearthstone and probably having more fun with it as well. Yeah. So. And like we said, this becomes more and more intuitive over time. And it's a, mm-hmm. it's a cum- cumulative process. You, you gather more and more information, the more and more you play. And to be honest, it's it's a matter of, of experience. The players exactly. who are able to sync a ton of hours into this and become very, very acquainted with every little detail about this game do have an edge over those who don't. Exactly. Um, all right. So we just have a few quickies now, just a few uh, categories where the idea of range applies, but not nearly as in depth. One of those is your next draw. You can actually create a range for this really easily. Uh, it's just basic statistic. It's the idea of taking the amount of the card you want to draw, let's say, you know, Consecration, you have two of those in your deck, you need to draw it. So you take that number, two, then you divide it by the total cards left in your deck. So let's say you have 17 um, cards left in your deck. And then that, uh, once that's, you divide... That's, a, that's weird math. Let's just make it 18 to make it nice. Okay, 18. So you have 18 cards left in your deck. You have two of the card you want to draw. You just divide that by 18. And you, oops, that's 148. That is not the right number. No, no, no. You divide 18 by 2. So it would be a 1 in 9 chance to try. Uh, you're right. There are two ways to go about it. I was going about the other way where you get the percentage, which is point. Oh, yeah. If you actually want to get the the raw percentage. But either way works. So, yeah, you take 2, divide it by 18, and you have 0. 0.11. So, you know, about an 11% chance to be able to draw. So I'll put that formula in the show notes. Really simple. Just, you know, basic math. But it's a really, and it's something Deck Tracker tracks. But it's a really good way to just get an idea of, okay, I have this percentage to draw this. Um, an interesting thing you can do is, let's say you need three damage to do lethal. You can just take every card in your deck that can get you three immediate damage, combine that all into that first number, divide it by the cards left, and then you can get your percentage of getting lethal. So there are a lot of yeah, ways you so can Yeah, so if you have like five cards in your deck that deal three or more damage, and you have 20 cards left, 
you can be pretty sure that you have a one in four chance, a 25% chance of in your next draw drawing it. Totally. So there you go. Create some rangers for your next draw. And that again, puts you somewhat in control of it. You're not d- deciding what your next draw is, but you'd be like, okay, I have this much chance to get lethal. I have like a 50% chance to draw lethal. So I should probably set up for lethal rather than focusing on board control. Exactly. So. A good analogy that I like using for this is a soccer analogy. And it oh, is yeah. um, the fact that, you know, you can play soccer the right way where you're looking at the field and looking at the players and being aware of what's happening and what's coming at you. Or you could play soccer just by looking down at the field and never and never looking up to see what's coming. You're just looking yeah. at your feet. And um, sure, if you're doing this, you might get lucky and the ball might reach your feet. You might have enough of a sense of direction to be able to aim at the goal and shoot and score a goal. And fantastic, you did it. But the truth is, if you take the time to look up and try to discern that hidden information from you, you can see things coming at you. You can see the opposing player trying to tackle you so you can dodge it. You can actually see how to get to the goal and score. Yeah, what may seem like the correct step to take or the correct move to make based on just your own skill, your own feet, and your own athletic ability, when you realize the environment around you, it was actually the wrong move. And I think that's what becomes really interesting is you can look at your hand and be like, obviously, I played this card on this turn. But then when you look at the information around you that you weren't even seeing, that is suddenly is not the best play anymore, even mm-hmm. though it was obviously the best play, just taking your hand as an isolated yeah, piece if of you only If you only take into account the known information then yeah. you are playing this game blindly. That's I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Exactly, yeah. I think that's a really good analogy. Um, also, I I feel bad for the kid who's playing soccer just staring at his feet the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know like, if that oh, actually happens. Guy? I'm pretty sure that if actually if somebody does that, Maybe other people has, are like, pretty ro- quick to let him know, like, man, you, you gotta look up, dude. <laughs> Maybe he has, like, really, really nice shoes, and he's like, man, these shoes are awesome. I can't stop yeah. staring at them. <laughs> look at this, this card is- pack. It's so cool. It just blends uh, so well with the grass. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. So we have our fourth category here. Um, we could get super in depth on this, but that would take forever because it would take to, uh, talking about every card that has RNG effects. And we're not going to do that. But mm-hmm. random effects are here to stay in Hearthstone and are a big part of Hearthstone, as people know. Um, but as you could probably just figure out on your own by now, there are totally ways to apply ranges to the random cards in Hearthstone. Um, you take just one random card, for example, like Implosion. What's interesting about these is the ranges are way more set and way more predictable than all the other information we've been dealing with so far, or most of it. Like Implosion, for example, only has three possible outcomes, two damage and two imps, three damage and three imps, or four damage and four imps. So instead of just throwing your Implosion out there and saying, man, I sure hope that deals four damage because I need it to, you can calculate each of the different probabilities. Uh, You know, it's a 33% chance of each of these things happening. And the, uh, how many of these possibilities you'd be okay with happening? Like, if this deals three damage, am I still okay making this play? If this deals two damage, am I still okay making this play? If this deals four damage, etc. Then weighing that into whether or not you want to make the play. If yeah. you're cool you, with, yeah, go ahead. You, yeah, I'm just gonna say you weigh your odds. Exactly. If you're cool with all three of those happening, that's how I try to play Implosion. If I'm like killing a knife juggler with Implosion and the extra imps on top of that are just gravy, then awesome. Sometimes you have to take a calculated risk and, you know, hope for the four damage. But it's that idea of keep in mind that any of these can happen and base your game plan around that. Never like put all of your eggs in one basket. If yeah, you have an sometimes you might be in a tough spot, but you, you might be able to recognize that if your Implosion rolls four, mm-hmm. you could turn this game around. And if... And maybe the other cards that you play are just a terrible line of play that would probably lose you a game in the end. So <laughs> you might, at that point, you might take the chances. But on the other hand, if you're ahead in the game and you know that you use your implosion and it rolls a two on a certain creature, you might actually lose the lead. Then you might be a little more conservative and be like, okay, I'm just going to kill this two health creature with implosion, which I know I will kill for sure. Mm-hmm. And then kill this other creature another way that I know for sure I can kill it. Exactly. And some cards are way more complex than Implosion. There are cards like Pilot Shredder or Confessor Paltris that can be like summoning a minion of two cost or any legendary minion. Yeah. It's way harder to say every probability for that outcome, but think, you know, think through it as much as you can. Like, yeah, any it's ranges. a lot harder, but what a lot of like really good players do is instead of like mm-hmm. trying to take into account every single card, they clump yeah. them together into groups. So, for example, for a Pilot or Shredder, a lot of players would take the average of the stats yeah, and will exactly. let you know, for example, on average, from a Paladin Shredder, 
you get like a two three million or a three two yep. million. I, I don't I don't know the actual average, but the exactly. information is out there. Or you can also take out information like oh from a pilot shredder you have a ten percent chance to get a taunt minion, or you mm-hmm. have a seven percent chance to get a minion with four attack. Yeah. That's a really good point. There are lots of, uh, you know, statistics and stuff you can look up for specific scenarios. For example, like if you have no other recourse, sometimes you can kill a pirate, pilot of Shredder and get a Doomsayer out of it. And sometimes yeah, it's you like see, you have you no see other people choice. people doing in tournaments all the time when they uh-huh. they know things are looking very grim. And that happened at the last game night we had and I won because of it. Uh, the Doomsayer? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sometimes. I mean, that could be a last recourse, right? If you know that nothing else in your hand solves it, you yeah. might just want to pop the Shredder in hopes that you get that 2% chance of a Doomsayer. Yeah. The thing about RNG effects is don't rely on them winning you the game when you can get around it and use them to your control, and they're not nearly as random anymore. They're kind of like a last resort at that point. Exactly. So uh, there's a lot of control and ranges you can do on RNG effects. Absolutely. I really uh, appreciate using that as often as I can. The last category, and we already touched on this a bit, but it is another idea of unknown information in Hearthstone, and very popular right now, is Secrets. Um, secrets are really fun, uh, because they have the unique, uh, ability that you can play around them. Uh, I'll go through the few things you can do real quick to determine what a secret is. So, all right, you're facing an opponent and they play a secret. The first thing you're going to be able to tell is what the secret's class is. Mind you, I'm not saying your opponent's class, but I'm saying the class of the secret, because it is possible to get secrets from other classes with certain spells. But the secret itself, when it's played, has a mana cost they spent for it, and it also has a color. So, you know, if it's golden, it's paladin. If it's, uh, pink, it's mage, etc. Um, or is pink mage? Or is that hunter? No, yeah, pink is mage, I think. Anyway, the color will correspond to the class. There are, so that's the first thing you can tell, which is what, uh, what secret belongs to which class. After that, you can tell what, uh, opponent, uh, what your opponent's deck is. So for example, if your opponent is a mech mage or a tempo mage, you can be pretty sure that the secret is either going to be, um, mirror entity or it's going to be, uh, Counter spare, really? Yes. But Every once yeah, in a while, more than energy. likely mirror entity because you are now aware of the deck archetype and you know that they like running mirror entity there. Exactly, because but it's you a can tempo be... deck, so it makes sense running something else. Exactly, but you can be pretty sure it's not like ice block. So that already narrows down an already very narrow list of like five or six cards, even further to like two or three. Um, after that, you can think about, okay, have they played any secrets yet? Same principle as cards being played. If they played, you know, two of one secret, then they can't have it anymore. If they played one of a secret and have two of it, it's less likely they'll have it now. So just think about what secrets have been played already, uh, and, and what would they want to be doing going forward? Also, a very important thing to know is how, Mm -hmm. how the secrets trigger. Every secret triggers in a very specific fashion, right? There's a special trigger that triggers it. Some trigger when you hit the phase, some trigger when you hit a minion, some Mm -hmm. trigger when a minion dies. So being aware when this secret trigger is very, very important in you being able to play around them. Exactly. Once the secret has been played, think of what are all of the triggers that have happened so far. For example, in if a hunter plays a secret, you're like, okay, so have I played a minion since then? If I have, then it's not snipe. Okay. So have I attacked their face yet? If I have, then it's not explosive trap. It's not freezing trap. It's not misdirection because all of those are triggered by attacking the uh, hero um, or in freezing traps case, attacking anything. Um, I have attacked a minion. If so, then it's not a snake trap. At that point, I'm not sure it can be a trap for hunter. <laughs> yeah, but... <laughs> it would have to trigger at some point now. <laughs> yes, uh, the game but is that, That's a basic point. Yeah, you can yeah. you can start uh, guessing secrets by process of elimination, and sometimes based on how detrimental secrets are against you, mm-hmm. the order in which you check is very important. That's a really good point. And that's a that's a big thing is knowing when and how to trigger them. Different for every secret, different for every class, but always weigh the likelihood of like, is it worth costing a bit of tempo or taking a little bit of extra time to make sure he doesn't mirror entity my piloted shredder? Mm-hmm. Uh, so there are definitely ways to play around them. Um, something else that I actually didn't put here in the outline, but I think can be important is, again, your opponent's play style and when and how they play the secret. Andres, you totally touched on this earlier, but uh, if they played a knife juggler, on top of the secret, it's more likely that the secret is snake trap, that sort of thing. So keeping in mind how and when they play it can often tell you what the secret is before it's even triggered, um, because they're often trying to create a circumstance in which the secret gets them the the most possible benefit. Yep. Um, so let's see here. That that about covers secrets. They're they're pretty simple. Um, the, again, it, compared to like trying to predict how many or what cards your opponent has, the secrets is like a very um, 
closed system that you can test the idea of ranges in because they're only you know five or yeah, six yeah, per yeah. class. And you'll get familiar with them, especially when you accidentally trigger them and you learn <laughs> your lesson the hard way. Oh my gosh! Yes. Another important <laughs> note is secrets only trigger on the turn, the opponent's turn. Of the person who has the secret. For example, if your opponent plays a secret, it only triggers at your turn. So if something happens, like one of their minions dies or something on their turn, that is not going to trigger duplicate or some secret or avenge or a secret that's triggered by that. An interesting fact, because Harster didn't used to work that way, but they patched it pretty early on and now secrets do. So, man, how OP would Secret Paladin be if secrets still worked the old way? Oh, Jesus, no. Or Mage. Imagine duplicate <laughs> or uh, effigy. Effigy being able to trigger it on your own turn. Jesus, that would oh. be terrifying. Yes, it would. All right, and that does it. We have officially gone through all of the uh, Woo! all of the concepts of range. That that was fun. That was good. All right. Hopefully, this episode wasn't too crude. I know this is a little more mathematical and it's a little more abstract to think about the game. Yeah. But truly, this is what is going to separate you and become a much better player. Uh, the best players in this game have become very adept at predicting and creating ranges to the point where they can be very precise and narrow down their opponent's choices down to the dot sometimes. They can call yeah. out cards way ahead. And it's a it's a fun skill to develop, you know what I mean? Even mm-hmm. um, when you're watching maybe a stream or a tournament, just yep. being able to predict what cards your opponent is uh, there or the people you're watching are going to play and call plays and that sort uh-huh. of thing is, uh, is really cool. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would say range is easily the skill in Hearthstone that I'm still working on improving the most. Um, I'd say it's one of the highest, like, skill I think it's a skill that game. everyone is trying to improve yeah. the most. <laughs> I, I think it's the highest <laughs> skill cap skill in the game. Uh, like we said, it's really where you go once you have the fundamentals down. So I, I say that in a way that I mean, it's not something that uh, is necessarily just a beginner's concept or something that you should know and then move on to the next thing. This is probably what you're going to be working on. Yeah, this is going to be an ongoing future. concept. To be honest, <clears throat> this is how you get good at Hearthstone. Yes. This is the skill in Hearthstone. So hopefully we were able to give you an introduction to start working into that that wasn't too confusing. But that said, it's not just a beginner's concept. So it's very likely we're going to be doing more advanced episodes on this in the future. Um, cause there are a lot of great articles, sources, and people out there we can draw from that know a whole lot more about this than even we do. So, Absolutely. Uh, if you guys have any questions about anything that we just went over or you guys yeah. want, think we missed something that it's important to talk about, of course, feedback's always welcomed right to the show. We're always welcome to, uh, read what you guys write in and add it to the show if we think, you know, it's important. So, yeah. Speaking of which, I did want to give a shout out to Chris who sent in an email. Very prescient email before we even got this episode done, asking us to cover exactly this. Um, so hopefully this answered your questions, Chris. If it didn't, or there's anything you're still confused about, absolutely email back in and let us know if there's anything we can do to help you. Um, I, I tried to get across uh, to work all of your points and questions into the uh, show outline I put together here, but, you know, I could have missed something. So, Or something could have... We could have explained something badly. So yeah. just let us know. One thing that I want to address in Chris's email is that he asked... When is it too much? When for a new player, when is it too much to learn? What at what one point? At what point is good to stop? What is the minimum that I can do to still play the game well and right. uh, and have a good time? And I guess the only thing I want to add to that is that Chris, my man, it's never too much. <laughs> yeah, this is really That's depends on how far you want to go with the game and how where you want to take it. Mm-hmm. But to be honest with you, the player that knows more information and is able to piece together better clues and a better strategy and game plan will be the player who oftentimes wins and the hearthstone community level has grown quite a bit um this sort of information is kind of widespread right now and Mm -hmm. a lot of people maybe don't learn it in such a structured way but kind of pick it up uh throughout but yeah. These concepts are known and have been going around for a while now, from oh, yeah. you know the start of TCGs, or before that in poker, like yeah, in oh, poker and, and yeah. this sort of thing. So these these are not new concepts, and there's people out there who are very very well aware of them, and the mm-hmm. top players are using them all the time. If you yeah, want absolutely. to compete at the top level, then this is what you need to do, and you need to learn as much as possible and become an expert at predicting the game. If, on the other hand, you want, just want to have fun with the game and play with your friends, then, you know, uh, make it relevant to you. Just just learn 
the decks that you're playing against and yeah. uh you know or that your friends are playing yeah i go back to what we uh one of the points we opened up this episode with which is just focus on when you're playing learning as much as you can don't worry about how much someone else knows or how well someone else plays or th- you know the percentage of knowledge you have because that's always growing in hearthstone but just focus on every game did you learn something new every sitting did you did you focus on something new did you learn a new deck did you learn a new um did you predict a play you hadn't predicted before? Did you learn a possible play that you hadn't seen before? And just go through, we're going to be posting the outline with this. Go through our outline and maybe focus on a couple of things you want to start learning. Say, okay, I'm going to work on examining my opponent's deck. I'm going to figure out what deck archetype they're playing each game for 10 games and start writing that archetype down next to them. Once you have that down, you can be like, okay, I'm going to start analyzing their mulligan phase and see if I can start predicting their turn one, their turn two, and their turn three plays. And, you know, just take it step by step and uh, and work through the skills one by one and learn a little bit through each day. And and, and don't work, worry so much about the end goal and worry more about the little bit you can get yeah, each time. Yeah, absolutely. Time. And like I said, this might sound like super daunting, especially if you're starting out the game, but yeah. it's a cumulative effect. And the more you do it, the more intuitive it becomes and the more second mm-hmm. nature it becomes um, to the point where, you're, you know, you're not trying to learn this thing forever. Once you learn Agra Druid, you learn Agra Druid and you know what they yeah. play and you know how to play against it. And a lot of those fundamentals will be used in a similar deck that comes out in the future. So yeah. yeah. The it's bottom not, line it, it comes to experience. Just play the game and play the game and be very analytical as you're playing a game. Mm-hmm. Critical thinking is very important in this game and you should be, if you want to improve, you should be very analytical of all your games. Absolutely. All right, that'll do it for this episode. Uh, before we close out here, Andres, anything um, you want to say about uh, the upcoming tournaments? Anything you're particularly excited about for the championship? Um, no, just that, you know, my favorites are still in uh, in, in the game. Thais, Hot Form, and uh, Ping Ping Ho. They're playing right now, so one of them might not be in there anymore. I'm hoping not. I'm hoping all three of them qualify, but uh, we'll right. see. Yeah, we, we will. Uh, something we're excited about doing uh, is our next episode, our current plan is to make a tournament primer for people who want to know more about tournaments or maybe aren't super familiar with tournaments. It's going to be going over kind of how tournaments work at Hearthstone, the history of tournaments, um, the uh, and especially the BlizzCon Championship coming up, who's playing in it, um, when it's happening, why you should be excited about it. Something I'm really excited about doing and learning about, because I haven't really been following tournaments over the past year since the last championship, so I'm, I'm excited to... Uh, kind of catch back up with this and have Andres teach me some about um, what's going on and, and why I should uh, why I should care about this upcoming championship. Yeah, absolutely. If you guys want to learn a little more about Conquest and tournament play, I think our next episode is going to be about that. We're going to release it a, a little bit before the World Championship. Mm-hmm. It's, it's going to be centered a little bit around the World Championship. You know, we'll probably talk about the lineups that they're bringing and yeah. the strategy that they're using. Although we want to make it more of a general tournament thing, Conquest style. So that uh, maybe players are trying to get into the tournament scene or that are not as familiar with this sort of format can get a little taster, a little few hints and stuff. We're going to try to have a guest with us. We don't have an yep. official name right now, but... Um, I will tweet about it. Yeah, yeah when just we have stay it all tuned. Confirmed. And uh, if you guys want to know, just tune in the next episode. Totally. It's very exciting stuff. Um, and we do also have some ideas for more episodes after the tournament one. So we'll be having news on those as well soon. Uh, speaking of which, if you want to find our tweets, you can follow us at Hearthaholics on Twitter. Um, if you want to leave us an iTunes review, you can go to iTunes. We're just Hearthaholics on there. Uh, we're also on like Stitcher and other, um, RSS and podcast applications out there. Uh, we're on YouTube and Facebook as Hearthaholics. And we are part of the Whales Are Whales Network. That's Whales, A-R-E, Whales.com, where you can go to find other great shows like this with other great people like us. You can also follow Whales Are Whales on Twitter. That's like a master feed. It'll tweet out Heart the Holics episodes and any other podcast and shows we do. So definitely check that out if you're interested in hearing more of our work. Um, also, we do game nights for fellow Hearthstone podcast, The Angry Chicken. You can find their uh, Reddit at slash TAC podcast. Um, there's subreddit there and there are two sticky posts, one for the Monday night game nights, which are competitive game nights that Andres hosts at 6.30 PM every Monday, uh, central daily time. That's right. And then the other is the Wednesday night game night that I host every, uh, Wednesday night at 8 PM CDT. And we focus mostly on tavern brawls since they come out that, uh, that day and weird, random, um, goofy decks, which is really fun. So super, super fun. Encourage you to check it out. If you guys, uh, want to have like a little conquest style, uh, throw down, or you guys want to have a fun time with Turn Brawls and Friends, we got it all. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, and yeah, we're, we're off from there. So if you or like every week, so if you want to talk to us, check those out. Uh, and that will do it for the show. You can find me on Twitter at Lord Meldor, L-O-R-D-M-E-L-D-O-R-R. And you can find Andres on Twitter at I Play Games, I-P-L-A-I Games. And also our intro and outro music is done by Mass Eve Music. That is M-A-S-S-E-V-E music.com, which is Andres' music production company, which both made our awesome song and also creates a bunch of other music that you can use uh, for Twitch or YouTube or anything else you'd like to license music for. So if you want to listen to cool tunes or license them, check out MassiveMusic.com. All right, everybody. Yes, do it right now. <laughs> we're not ending this episode until you do it. All right. No, we're we're going to stay right here with you until you do it. Are you doing it right now? We're, we're watching. It? Yeah. Okay. Okay. You did it. All right. Awesome. Cool. <laughs> All right, everyone. We'll talk to you next week. And until then, keep playing Hearthstone, please. It's very important. <laughs> Have a Peace. good week, everyone. Let's go. Let's go.